Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to my talk on image handling in Android. So my name is Tyrone, and I'm a software engineer at Facebook here in London, working on the Android infrastructure team. I came to Facebook from Google, the other side, where I had been spending time working on the Google Play Store, an application that most Android developers know and love. So, out of curiosity, how many of you here are Android developers? Almost everybody. Excellent. And how many of you here have problems with images? Yeah, quite a few. Image handling is quite difficult, and the reason it's difficult is a simple asymmetry. Images are big, devices are small. A mobile device, at most, may have two gig of memory, but that two gig is not what it appears. Manufacturers will typically give you a smaller amount, one tenth of the device, to use and available to your applications. So you can have a two gigabyte device, but only 128, 256 meg is available to your app. But we have lots of small, older devices out there. We have users in emerging markets who are buying new devices with 384 meg of physical memory total, and their heap is only going to be 32 meg of memory available to a Java application. And consider what an image is. When you decompress an image out of JPEG and show it on the screen, every single pixel has eight bits for red. It is eight bits for blue, eight bits for green, and eight bits for alpha. As if that was not enough. So 32 bits per pixel times the number of pixels means that for a medium-sized image, 480 by 800, which is probably the most common size of phone screen today, but it's not a big phone, is 1.5 meg out of a heap that could only be 32 meg. We have devices that are only running with 16 meg of memory, and one tenth of all the memory to your application can be used by a single full-screen photo. So what is Facebook more than anything else? It's an application for looking at photos. People will go connect on Facebook and they will scroll through their newsfeed and they'll see photo after photo that their friends have linked to, that their friends have posted. They'll see entire albums of photos that their friends have posted. They will expand image after image after image to full screen. And how do we do this? How do we have 1.5 meg or more on a high-end device of memory without totally hosing the system? So to understand this, we have to. See the problems are with garbage collection. Garbage collection is why most of us use Java. When you use a language that is garbage collected, you don't have to worry about memory, or so the theory goes. You just create your object, and when you stop referencing it, the garbage collector will magically swoop in and clean it up for you. And in the hotspot Java environment that you use on the servers, that's enough. That garbage collector is very well tuned. It has a young generation and an old generation, and Edens and survivor spaces, and Lord knows what else. And you don't have to worry too much about it affecting your performance. But on Android, you're using Dalvik, and Dalvik does things differently. There's a thread called the garbage collector concurrent thread that runs side by side with your application, and any time that you can't allocate enough memory, it will try to free up memory for you. And the more memory that it needs to free up. The slower your app will run because that thread will take up more of the CPU. But it gets even better than that because there are limits to what the gar concurrent garbage collector can do. If you are trying to allocate memory, and the concurrent GC cannot free it, then the VM will stop the world. Every single thread in your process halts while the garbage collector runs, including, of course, the UI thread. So suddenly you have a user who is scrolling through Facebook looking for the next picture of a cat, and then he. Start, it's not moving. What the hell are those bastards on Facebook doing? I want to see the cat. Because it is garbage collecting, and it can do this at any time. Basically, whenever you call the new operator, you could have a stop the world garbage collector. The more news you do, the more your app can potentially slow down. The bigger the new you're doing, and the biggest one of all is usually a bitmap, the more your app will slow down. And that's still not the worst case scenario. If the garbage collector can find enough memory for you, you slow down a bit. And the user keeps going, but what happens if you can't do it? There isn't enough memory. 1.5 meg is too much. You only have 32 meg. You've had your fill of cat photos today. You get this. So, how many of you using Facebook and Android have seen this actual dialogue? Yeah, quite a few of you have. We spend a lot of time trying to fix these. And a word of advice: if you do see it, please press the button on the left, report. It really makes my job a lot easier if you do that. And for people who have pressed report. A very common source of these errors is this guy, Java dot lang dot out of memory error. At that point, we say, "Oh, forget the rest of the stack trace. It's just we have run out of memory." 
And the thing it is, is we have not done anything wrong. In the server, if you're getting an out-of-memory error, it means that your app has a bug that is leaking memory. But you can be doing everything right on Android. You are freeing memory as soon as you're done with it. You're not showing any more than you have, and you still get these things. It's because the memory requirements are just so large. So how can we get around this? So we have to talk about the heap. On server-side Java, you allocate memory from the heap, and there's only really one heap. It's only one computer, after all. Not so on Android. Android decides to have not one, not even two. It decides to have three heaps. The first one is called the Dalvik heap. This is the heap most of you would use. When you call new in Java, it allocates from the Dalvik heap. So it's very limited. You don't get the full physical memory of the device. You get just the one-tenth or whatever the manufacturer has chosen to give you. And it is very slow, because at any moment, it could force a garbage collection. And you could then be stuck waiting for the new to complete. But it is safe in that you have a garbage collector. If you forget to free memory, it will be eventually freed. You don't have to worry about memory leaks as much. You still can have memory leaks, but they're very subtle and relatively uncommon. In contrast to that is the native heap. So the native heap is not available directly to a Java developer. You have to write your code in C++ using the native development kit. There is no native heap limit. Physical memory of the device is at your disposal. You can allocate as much memory as you could possibly want. It is very fast because there's no garbage collector running. So you can have the memory immediately. You don't have to worry about how long it'll take to run. But it is very unsafe because there is no garbage collector running. If you forget to free the memory, then you will eat up all the native memory on the device, and Android will get mad at you, and it will terminate your process. You don't even get that dialogue that I showed you earlier. How many of you have been using an Android app, and you're doing something and suddenly just disappears, and you're back on the home screen? Ever seen that? That's quite probably a native memory crash. We don't even get a crash report on the server. Nothing happens. You don't even know that your users have crashed. They just do. And if it hasn't crashed, what it can do before it does so is it will not just slow down your process, but even when you background it, it will slow every process on the machine. The entire system will slow down. The kernel will not be able to get enough memory. Really, really bad things happen if you abuse the native heap. And the third heap, Google gave it a very clever name. They called it the other heap. It's actually a miscellaneous collection of heaps. There's 16 of them. Um, the details are not really all that important. The point is that you can, they behave much the same way as the native heap. They have the same dangers and the same advantages, but you can only get to them from certain system calls. There's one in particular that I'm going to talk about later. So what is it that we do with images? Well, when you think about it, when you're scrolling through Facebook, either looking at messages or scrolling through your news feed or looking at somebody's timeline, all these images come down off the network. But we don't want to fetch them from the network from scratch every single damn time. That would be silly. If the user scrolls back up again, you don't want to do another network fetch. Networks can be really, really slow and unreliable. These are cell phones, after all. So what do we do? We put them in a cache. We put everything in a cache. Every single image you download from Facebook is stored locally on your machine. We do have an upper limit, of course, because we don't want to take up too much space. But we cache everything. And in addition to that, we have a second level of cache a cache that lives directly in memory. To read things off the disk is not instance, and you don't want to do that while the user is scrolling. People want to see their photos now, now, now. So we have a memory cache. So we have a memory cache and a disk cache, and you have to consider that those other operations you do in the images. Our architecture ends up looking something like this, an image pipeline. So stuff in green on the left is done on the UI thread. When you first ask for an image, it checks right away. Do I have it in memory cache? If it does, it responds. If not, hand it off to a disk cache thread, which will read it from disk. If it's not there, hand it off to another thread. Every blue box is done in a separate thread, which will download it off the network in WebP form. On older devices that don't support WebP, we have to transform that or transcode it back into JPEG. We then have to do two things in parallel. We write it out to disk, and the arrow going to the left, we decode it. And then two more things in parallel. One, we send it back to the user so he can see the image. And in the second, we write it to the memory cache so that if they want to see it again shortly after, they can. So all this is a complicated process. And on every single one of these arrows, pretty much, there's an allocation. When you're reading stuff from network, it goes into memory. When you're reading stuff from disk, it goes into memory. You're passing memory back and forth. These are mostly compressed data, so this is in the order of kilobytes rather than megabytes, but still a lot. And any one of these could cause a new, which could cause a GC or an OOM, which is a bad thing. You don't want to do that. So what can we do differently? 
why don't we use the native heap? But I just said earlier, you can't use the native heap from Java code. Not directly, but how many of you have used the Java native interface? OK. So this won't look completely alien. You can write a code in that dreaded language, C++. On the first line, you can see copy to native, just, just passing in the Java environment, the class, and a Java byte array. You then get the length of that, and you allocate a native object of the same size. And then you use this method called get byte array region, which will copy from the Java heap into the native heap. And then you simply take that C++ pointer and cast it to an integer so Java can understand it and send it right back up. So suddenly, I've taken my memory that was in a Java byte array, and I've put it into a native byte array, and I have a reference to it that Java code can use. And I can easily write a method that does the reverse, that takes the C++ pointer and copies it right back out again. So when I need to keep these images around for a long time, such as in a cache, I can just do so in the native heap, and I don't have to eat up a lot of my Java memory. You could write something like this, a stream. So this is simply a sample code um, that extends the output stream, an ordinary Java output stream. And when you're given a Java byte array to write, you simply copy it to native. In this case, I keep a map of the C++ pointers and the length of each object that they reference. But sometimes you might not need that. You might want to use a standard length and just keep a list of those. It doesn't matter. The point is that you can stream directly into native, and it is not hard to write the exact opposite something that allows you to stream, again, right back out of native code. So this seems to solve a lot of problems. I can keep a fixed size array of memory. I can simply decode everything from that. I can download images into that. And if I keep it the same size, if I keep it a pool and keep overwriting it as new images come in from the network, or as I'm reading and writing to disk, then I don't need to worry about leaking memory because I'm going to reuse the same memory over and over again. So suddenly, I'm not calling the Java new operator as much. I'm having a less probability of crashing, and everything should be a lot smoother. But there are limits to this, of course. And the limits have to do with bitmaps. So everything in displaying an image in Android revolves around a bitmap. And bitmaps are a Java class. They look like that. They're a final class, so you can't override them and subclass them and implement your own behavior. And behind the covers, there is an int in them. And that int is actually a C++ pointer. It is put there by the system when you decode it. The code to do that looks like this. So this function below is actually from the Android system code. There's a function called create bitmap, and it takes as an argument a C++ object called skbitmap. So skbitmap comes from the Ski library, an open source library that was developed by Google to process 2D images. It's used in Android to render images. It's also used in Google Chrome for the same purpose. So we allocate an object, and we just cast it back to an integer and call the bitmap constructor with that int. So it seems that both the Google system libraries and our application code are thinking along the same lines. The, the bitmap lives in native memory. It doesn't have to live in Dalvik memory. So we shouldn't be having any problems. And when Android first came out, this is exactly how bitmaps were implemented. They lived on the native heap. And starting in Android 3.0, which shipped in 2011, Google stopped doing this. They actually changed this function so that the C++ memory was actually allocated on a special Java heap. So it counts as part of your Dalvik allocation. So why would they do that? Why would they possibly take something that was really big out of the, Dalvik, out of the native heap and put it into the Dalvik heap? And the reason why is that people were abusing it. If you leave it in the native heap, the bitmap looks like it is just one integer long, 32 bits. So the garbage collector doesn't think it's under any memory pressure. So it doesn't garbage collect an abandoned bitmap. And they just sit there, filling up until you run out of int space. But by the time you've done that, your native heap has long since filled up. And this was happening randomly all over older Android applications. The system would just crash randomly for no, no particular reason. It was because bitmaps were filling things up. So Google engineers looked at this and decided, we can't let them do this. Java programmers need to get garbage collection called as soon as they're actually using up memory. So we're going to keep our implementation in C++, but we're going to allocate the memory on the Java heap. So this is a disaster for a company like Facebook. We're going to just not be able to cope with the number of images. So they left us one escape hatch, and that's a special piece of memory called ashmem. How many of you have heard of ashmem before? Oh, one person has. OK. So this is a fairly obscure piece of 
Android. It's actually part of the Linux kernel that ships with Android. It was an extension added by Google. It actually stands for Anonymous Shared Memory, and the intent of it was to share memory with other processes. At Facebook, we don't use it for that purpose. Um, we're not, we don't really want to share our memory with other processes. That's bad. So we simply don't release it there. Ashmem does not use the standard malloc and free operations that you usually deal with in memory. It has its own system calls. Create, pin, and unpin. So create tells the kernel, put this memory into Ashmem. Pin tells the kernel, I am using this memory, do not free it. And as long as you have the memory pinned, it does not get freed. It cannot get freed. And when you unpin it, that doesn't free the memory either. That says to the kernel, I can free it. You can free it if you want to, but you don't have to. So what the kernel does is it runs in a cycle. If it needs memory, and only if it needs memory, it goes looking for ashmem that is unpinned and frees that memory, and only that memory. So think about how this could be used for images. You have memory that is lazy freed. So you could, for instance, decode a bitmap into that memory. When you're drawing it, you could pin it. And as long as it's shown on the screen, it cannot be freed, because it is pinned. And as soon as it scrolls off screen, you can unpin it. And then it will be freed only if you need to. So if you scroll back and the memory hasn't been freed, kaboom. It's like, almost like a cache. Your data is still there waiting for you. So this seems to solve our problem, doesn't it? It means our memory is not in the Dava heap. It's in the Ashmem heap. It is freed by the system when we need it to be freed, but only then. And yet we don't have to constantly re-decode and decode again because the memory is still there, unless it's actually been purged. So what is the one flaw with this architecture? Yeah, we didn't see it either. And we used to wonder, why are we having these problems? Every so often, people would scroll and they would stutter. And we'd see these stuttering. You don't get a nice, smooth scrolling. And our colleagues in the iOS team would say, oh, you guys on Android suck. Look how smooth scrolling is on iOS. And we looked at it, and yes, smoothing on iOS is way scroller way faster on Facebook than it is on Android. Finally, we had a conversation with Google about this. He said, what is the problem? Is it, and they said, purgeable bitmaps? Are you still using purgeable bitmaps? That code is like three years old. Nobody's touched that. So our jaws collectively hit the floor. And this is how you'd actually use a purgeable bitmapping code. And then they added this paragraph to the Android developer documentation in November of 2013. We're pretty sure they added this because of the conversation they had with us. They said, oh, that impurgeable thing that was supposed to solve your problems? Don't use it. So the reason is this. The decode happens when you draw the bitmap, which means you are decoding on the UI thread. The UI thread is not supposed to do anything IO intensive. It is not supposed to do anything CPU intensive. It is supposed to respond to user events and nothing more. And when it is busy decoding, it means the user can't press a button, the user can't scroll, the user can't swipe, the user can't do a lot of things, and the user gets very upset at that. So that is the problem. Decoding is happening in the wrong place. And they didn't realize this when they built it. And if you're not doing a lot of decoding, it doesn't matter. But Facebook does a ton of decoding. We are using purgeable bitmaps. Instagram is using purgeable bitmaps. Facebook Messenger uses purgeable bitmaps. And if you've ever seen it stutter when you're trying to scroll or pause or inexplicably not operate the way you think it should, it's probably because of purgeable bitmaps. So Google says at the bottom, use the in bitmap flag again. What does in bitmap look like? Like this. When you're decoding a bitmap, you use the class bitmap factory, you simply specify an option in bitmap. And you pass in a bitmap that already exists. So the decode goes into an existing set of memory. So this way, you don't have to allocate a new bitmap every time you show one. You just take the last one who scrolled off screen and pop new data into it. So you allocate a pool of bitmaps, let's say you know, one per size. And into that pool, you keep reusing the same memory over and over and over again. And therefore, you don't need to constantly call the new operator, but you can still show as many images to the user as you want. So this sounds like a really good solution. And we really wanted to use it. And we looked at it and studied it, and then we realized we could not use it for two reasons. One was this, again, direct paste from the system docs. Added in API 11. That's Android 3.0. So about 15 to 20% of our users are using Android 2.3 or lower. Still, even though that version of Android is now close to four years old. 
And this is Facebook. We don't have tens of millions of users. We have hundreds of millions of users. So 15 to 20 percent of them is the population of a medium-sized country. We cannot abandon those users. And furthermore, a disproportionate number of those users are users who are from developing country markets. These are people who are getting a phone for the first time, getting a computer for the first time, getting a camera for the first time. All sorts of technological innovations that they've only recently started to use. And what are they doing with this? They're going on Facebook. And we want them to be able to see the photos on Facebook that they want to see. And we're not going to use a new API and just leave them stuttering with bad performance. But it turns out that InBitmap is not even that good a solution for newer phones because of this little caveat. Again, a direct quote from the developer docs. You must be in JPEG or PNG. Now, that doesn't sound unreasonable, but remember, this is Google. They developed another image format, which they called WebP. And they developed WebP to make the internet faster. And they succeeded. We find that with the WebP format, we can get 20% more compression for the same image than we can on JPEG. So 100K image becomes 80K. And for users who are paying for data, and you'd be surprised how many of them there are, this means a lot. So we send our images downstream in WebP, and then we find we cannot pull bitmaps unless we transcode them, which is going to slow things down even more. And that's not even the worst part. The second sentence says there, only equal-sized bitmaps are supported. Now, if all your images are the same size, this is not a problem at all. How many different image sizes do you see scrolling through Facebook? The answer is a lot. Users sometimes put a lot of effort into making their images the exact size they want. They will crop it, they will spend time editing photos in Photoshop sometimes, and when they upload an image with a particular aspect ratio, they want that aspect ratio preserved. And we do this. And that means we have a very large number of different image sizes. And that means we'd have to keep a pool for every single image size. So that's not going to work. So this solution isn't a solution. So what did we do? We had to go off the grid. We had to do something that is not in the developer documentations. We had to do something that could be even called a hack, but we felt this was the solution that's going to work best for our users. Now, before I go further, I should say that this is new code. This is not in production yet. This is experimental. So I cannot honestly recommend that it be used, not yet, not until it's been better tested. There is a method in the Android NDK called Android Bitmap Lock Pixels, and this is the source code of that method. The key point is the, the first line in green, get native bitmap. That just gets the SK bitmap that is actually storing the, pigma, the, the pixel data. And the second green line is calling lock pixels. What lock pixels does is all the ashmap stuff. It pins the memory for you and it decodes the bitmap. So you see what we have here. We have a method in the native development kit that does something that you cannot do from Java. You can decode a bitmap off thread and still keep it in ashmap. So think about the implications of this. All you have to do is write a method called lock bitmap. And that could be implemented like so. You take a bitmap and you call lock pixels on it. And you ignore what the developer docs say. The docs say for every lock, you must unlock. The intent is that if you wanted to transform a bitmap using some custom native code, you would lock it, do some changes to it, and then unlock it again. We don't unlock it. We leave it locked. And suddenly, the application is in control, not the system, not the framework, not the libraries. We decide when we're going to do the decode, and we make sure that we do it off the UI thread, and we also decide when the memory gets freed. We don't let the system make that decision. So our code just has to look like this. When you are doing a decode, you specify an option in purgeable, and then you just call immediately afterwards lock bitmap. And now you're in command. You don't have to have a huge pool of purgeable bitmaps piling up there. You only have to have a limited number. And as long as you recycle the image when you're done with it, the decode happens completely off thread, and you can smooth, uh, smoothly scroll through your images without having to stutter, without having to jape. And if you add to that the additional change what I outlined earlier, that you've put the intermediate buffers into native memory, well, then your images are barely in the Dalva keep at all. And suddenly, your out-of-memory errors should go down a lot, and a lot of your garbage collection problems should go down. Your application should be smoother and more responsive. The only caveat is you have to recycle afterwards. What happens if you don't recycle the image? Recycle is a method on the bitmap class that frees the memory and unpins it. If you don't do that, 
you are going to fill the system up with AshMem again. And this is one reason that we haven't shipped this yet, is because making sure you figure out exactly when your image is done is sometimes non-trivial, especially in a very complex application. In a simple application, though, this is relatively easy. Just when you scroll off screen, recycle. And when it scrolls back onto screen, take it out of cache. You're done. So if I had to summarize this, it would be don't consider yourself bound by the limitations of Java on Dalvik. Take great power by using system calls in the way you can do them. Use AshMem, use native code judiciously in order to give yourself the power to give your users the experience that they want and need. But with that great power comes great responsibility because you can crash and burn in ways that you can't crash and burn directly from Java code. So I hope this talk has been useful to you. And maybe I've gone a bit too fast as we have a lot of time left, so there's plenty of time for questions. Yes? Are there any plans like down the line, of course, when it's been formally tested and uh, mm -hmm. being in production ready to release some sort of uh, a library that other people can use? Sort of, uh, yes, actually, we, the question was, would we plan to release a library that other applications could use? We very much would like to do that. Um, the hard part of doing that in a large application is disentangling it from the rest of our code, which is actually harder than releasing uh, the product directly. Um, I can't give you a date on that. That's still several months out. But uh, as soon as you have an announcement to make, we will make one on that front. Yes? So you mentioned you can't use, or you want to avoid using newer APIs or lock out of our users on older devices. Do you yeah. have anything conditional to say, hey, if I am running on a newer device, I'll use this, this you know, the native methods and all the built in stuff that you can make your level? Yeah. So the question was, could we use conditional code to have the newer platforms take advantage of the newer APIs? The trouble is that the problems we're trying to solve happen most frequently on the older platforms. So if we simply don't solve the problems there and solve them for the newer platforms that don't have them as much, that's not really what we want to do. So we want to fix the older platforms as long as people are still using them. Sure, I understand that, but I'm just wondering whether you, you do have, if you have a new device, mm -hmm. The thing of it is, is we don't think that the standard solution is better even on the newest platform. Even on KitKat, when you're still pooling memory and you're still taking advantage of the lack of a size limit, you're still in the Dalva keep. And that's not as good as putting things in AshMem. So if there was a truly better solution, and it's possible that one may emerge in future versions of Android, they're going to have a different runtime engine, ART it's called, and that may provide a solution that Dalvik doesn't have, but we would consider that once it gets released. Other questions? Oh, come on, there's got to be some. Yes? So Picasso, Picasso is a very well-designed API. We did look at it. Um, what it's doing behind the covers is basically in bitmap, though. And when you have different sizes, that's not going to perform well for the same uh, reasons that I outlined here. So we weren't able to use that. Okay, thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of the day.